So let's finally talk about the performance of this thing right here, the RTX 4090. And yeah, it is truly insane. Like the kind of frames that this thing is pushing out at like 4K max graphics, yeah, you won't believe the numbers are until you see them. So we've already gone over the exterior design and how this is different and talked about the specs and everything like that. Today, we are solely focusing on the performance and the benchmarks. Now, the first benchmark that I ran for the 4090 was this right here. Forza Horizon 5 running 4K completely maxed out. And I mean, I had to double check that I wasn't running lower settings or mess something up here, but no, this is real. This is the new 4090 literally doubling the performance of the 3090. This is also without any ray tracing, DLSS or anything like that. Just pure rendering output and it's pretty insane. Then I switched over to God of War, also 4K here at the highest possible settings. And again, no ray tracing or DLSS just yet. We'll get to that in just a minute. But I mean, just look at the brute output of this GPU. It's so much higher than I expected without those RTX effects enabled. Here we're looking at about an 80% increase over the RTX 3090, and it's not far off triple the performance of a 2080 Ti, which is still a strong GPU by today's standards. Games that might have been previously demanding at 4K, even on last gen flagship GPUs, they're just not even remotely challenging for the 4090. Dying Light 2, for example, the 2080 Ti does struggle a bit, you'd probably need to lower some settings, and the 3090 just delivers a 60 FPS plus experience. The new RTX 4090 though, I mean, it's kind of almost laughable at how fast it actually is. Now, if that wasn't ridiculous enough, here's the new Overwatch 2 running at 4K with medium settings, and there are multiple times here where the 4090 hits the in-game frame rate limit of 600 FPS. Again, that's at 4K. Now, of course, those kind of frame rates, they're possible at lower resolutions with weaker GPUs and lower settings. But again, just to flex the raw rendering power of the 4090, it's pretty nuts. Nvidia are always kind of secretive about the gains of rasterization only performance when they announce these GPUs. And that causes people to kind of speculate that the performance gains aren't that much. But as you can see, they are still pretty substantial without even factoring in ray tracing or DLSS. So in the end, when we're looking at pure rasterization output, Output, we're averaging close to double the performance of the RTX 3090 at 4K. That means that most of the time you're actually hitting over 150 FPS with maxed out settings. And in some cases, you're actually going beyond what the fastest 4K monitors are possible of displaying. So yeah, I really meant it when I said this thing is insane. Like you just won't actually believe the benchmarks until you actually see them. And they're just mind boggling to see 4K running at those kind of frame rates, especially with maxed out settings. Talking about settings, let's now talk about ray tracing and DLSS. And the thing about these features is they're no longer really considered niche or special features. For one, the amount of games that actually support RTX and you know, ray tracing and stuff like that is a huge list of games, like most modern games coming out will have these features implemented. And secondly, I've also seen some games have these settings enabled by default. Like if you go and select high or ultra high, you will actually have to intervene and turn off ray tracing because that's what the developer has put in as an ultra high setting. So as you'd expect with more RT cores and tensor cores on the 4090 as well as just being more powerful in general, switching on RTX leaves the 4090 with a much more capable experience. Here we're looking at control running at 4K, everything maxed out including ray tracing and also with DLSS set to the balanced mode. The RTX 4090 has a new trick though and that's a DLSS 3 feature called frame generation. In a nutshell what this is doing is comparing two frames that have already been rendered and it uses AI to make a completely new one in between them. Essentially it's artificially increasing your frame rate by inserting AI fake generated frames and as you can see the frame rate increases by doing this even over the increase by you know using DLSS in performance mode is really really strong. In the end it's about a 50% bump here in Cyberpunk which is comfortably running at around 140 FPS. Now when you take a look at how much frame rate cheating is kind of happening here, it's pretty insane. With max settings and ray tracing enabled over on the left there, you can get a grasp for how demanding graphically these settings actually are without any AI generated frames or AI upscaling techniques. With DLSS and the new frame generation though, you're effectively getting over triple the frame rate. One of the coolest parts about this though is that you can kind of cheat your way past CPU bottlenecks. Microsoft Flight Simulator, for example, has a massive CPU bottleneck 
Mac, but here it is somehow running at over 200 frames per second. Now look, it's pure overkill here with the 4090, like no one needs to be playing this game at 4K at these frame rates, but when this feature trickles down to the lower end cards that aren't as capable at 4K or 1440p, that's a bit of a game changer for certain games. For those wondering as well, it is also possible to run the new frame generation feature without any form of DLSS upscaling, and the frame rate boost there by running it alone is still pretty strong. So frame generation is pretty interesting, and we'll get to my personal thoughts on it in just a second. I did quite a bit of playing with it uh, in Cyberpunk, but you know, aside from it not giving you perfect frames all the time, which to be honest, you don't really notice if you're like playing through the game quite fast. It's really only something that you notice if you're like recording gameplay and then you go back to kind of pixel peep the frames. Otherwise, if you're just playing through, you really don't notice those AI generated frames and that kind of simulation. The other thing though, which you do definitely notice with this feature is the increase in input lag. In Flight Simulator, for example, there is a massive 46% bump to frame rate as we saw, but there's also a pretty big jump in latency. In this case, it's almost double compared to just enabling DLSS. Cyberpunk wasn't as bad, but still a pretty considerable increase, about plus 12 milliseconds here over just using DLSS. So although DLSS upscaling provides both a frame rate increase and latency decrease, frame generation also gives you a frame rate buff, but at the same time increasing latency. So having this in mind, I actually played Cyberpunk for a bit with this feature. I'd switch between frame generation on versus off, trying to get an on feel for the actual experience differences with and without the setting as opposed to kind of just looking at the numbers and yeah the increase in input lag you can feel it I think it's most noticeable on mouse and keyboard if you're like intentionally trying to notice it and you're switching the setting on and off if you're playing on controller though it's definitely less noticeable and I think the style of games that frame generation is more suited towards that kind of makes sense the increased latency it is still there on controller but not as bad what is way more noticeable in my opinion though which is a pretty easy trade-off for me is that massive boost in frame rate, especially in Cyberpunk where without frame generation, you're kind of sitting below 100 FPS. And you do notice that smoothness quite a lot. You know, your inputs will feel slightly heavier with frame generation on because of the extra input lag, but the gameplay overall, I would say at least, is improved with this feature. Now, of course, if you already have a game that can run at pretty high frame rates, this is a setting that you should probably just not worry about, especially if the gameplay suffers from that increased latency. F122, for example, is another game that will support DLSS 3 and frame generation. Again, pretty decent bump to frame rate here, but for a precise game like this, you're just better off lowering some actual quality settings if you feel like you need that extra frame rate. Now, something else that's new with the 40 series GPUs is the new NVENC encoder setup. So the 4090 is actually running two of the new NVENC encoders that can encode in AV1. As someone who does a bit of streaming on the side, I was personally pretty interested to see how much of a buff this would be compared to the NVENC on the 3090. In terms of quality, there's a pretty noticeable difference between H.264 and the new AV1. I'll have to pause frames here so that YouTube compression also doesn't get too involved, but you can see how much less blocky AV1 looks compared to H.264. Both of them here are running 1080p, 8000 kilobits per second with preset 1 in OBS, which basically is the fastest and lowest quality preset. And this shot here, you can see how much cleaner AV1 looks. And it's actually way more noticeable when you're running lower bit rates. So preset 3 here, which is the fast kind of low to medium quality preset. And I mean, it's just night and day between H.264 and AV1. Even at just 4,000 kilobits per second, somehow AV1 just doesn't have that same kind of blocking compression, like at all. It also seems extremely good at recognizing visual elements like shapes, outlines, text, icons, and stuff like that, rather than just compressing it all into the same kind of muddy mess. Now, if you feed H.264 enough bitrate and also use the highest quality preset, which would be P7, it can look pretty good. It's just that AV1 still does look a lot better. Even with a high quality preset, H.264 can still be prone to that blocking and square compression that we're all familiar with. But to be honest, I just never saw that at all on AV1. Now, I also did some quick performance testing here too. In other words, how much performance or frame rate do we lose when we encode with either preset? And the results are aren't too conclusive. Uh, there seems to be about the same drop off in frame rate between the two and similar in fact on the previous NVENC setup with the 3090. I'll probably test this a little bit more, uh, but regardless, same performance drop off at higher quality seems to be a pretty fair trade to me. AV1 encoding can also be leveraged in video editing. So here we're looking at DaVinci Resolve Studio and the gains there are good. You know, they're not as extreme as the frame rates that we saw earlier or the frame generation DLSS 
process three, but overall you're looking at about 30% of time saved when it comes to video exporting, which for big projects is a lot of time saved. The gains in 3D rendering though are more impressive. Twice the rendering speed here of the 3090 in Blender, and almost four times faster than the 2080 Ti. Those gains carry right over to V-Ray, where we see just monster performance again, both in the RTX benchmark and when using CUDA. But what about that huge power increase? I mean, 450 watts, that's 100 watts more than a 3090, which is already quite insane. Like, yeah, it's faster, but it's kind of getting a bit ridiculous now for a consumer GPU. But here's where I was pleasantly surprised. In gaming, uh, you'd be pretty hard pressed to get this thing pulling the entirety of its TDP, which personally, I just expected it would because every other Nvidia GPU does that. But most of the time I saw it hovering between 360 and 390 watts. Sometimes it did tip over that 400 watt mark, you know, depending on the game, if it was demanding enough. It was only really in Furmark that I could get it going above that. And even still, it didn't pull the full 450 watts. So that's pretty unexpected. What's also unexpected is after running 30 minutes of Furmark, the card stayed under 70 degrees C. Also, I'll note the memory temperatures have been kind of fixed on the Founders Edition cards. Previously, they were around the 90 to 100 C mark, but now they're sitting around 80. This is all with an ambient room temperature of 22 degrees, and here's an idea of what the card sounds like at full load. Now some quick notes on overclocking, uh, I did manage to get the 4090 close to the 3 gigahertz mark, which is pretty insane, plus 220 on the core here, but ultimately that wasn't fully stable, so I lowered it to plus 200, and that was absolutely fine. Somehow I also managed plus 1700 on the memory, which makes for the fastest GDDRX speeds that I've ever seen, and in the end it's about a 9% bump to gaming performance here in God of War. Of course, not really a GPU that you'd need to overclock, but I mean there's a bit more room in the tank than usual, which is always nice to see. Now it's important to note that a lot of the kind of new features that we've talked about today, like the DLSS 3 frame generation and the new AV1 dual NVENC encoders, that stuff will also trickle down to the, you know, 4080s that have already been announced and the 4070 when that will come out and, you know, potentially the 4060 when that comes out down the road as well. So don't be pressured to buy the 4090 if those are just the kind of features that you're interested in, especially when the 4090 is just so brutally overkill for 99% of setups out there. Like, I really had to stop myself laughing at how ridiculous some of those numbers were at, you know, 4K maxed out graphics. Now, in terms of pricing, I'm going to say something that's maybe a little bit unpopular, but uh, I really can't see it any other way. And that's that the 4090 isn't really an overpriced GPU. Now, of course, the 4080 16 gig and the 12 gig, those are absolutely very overpriced, you know, just looking at how that pricing compares to the previous generation. But the 4090, you know, compared to the $1,500 3090, which was realistically a lot more expensive than that, and the $1,200 2080 Ti, compare the performance of those GPUs, you know, spending $100 more than the 3090, you're actually getting an insanely more powerful product. I mean, the kind of performance jump from the 3090 to the 4090, again, I'll just say it, it is absolutely insane. And of course, goes without saying, it's brutally overkill for 99% of the setups out there. Like if you don't have a 4K, 144Hz monitor or a 1440p 360Hz monitor that's coming out, uh, yeah, don't even take a second look at this GPU. Of course, if you want to use it for content creation, production workloads and stuff like that, it is definitely suitable for that stuff too. But exclusively looking at gaming performance, yeah, you need a very, very high-end gaming monitor to even display the amount of frames that this thing is pushing out. Otherwise, I'll leave some links down below for those interested. As always, a huge thanks for watching and stay tuned for a lot more content coming up on these GPUs and I'll see you all in the next one.